Trust India at Darbar Hall. We are delighted to announce the slave trade. For the session, we have Chris Manjapra, David Olusoga, and Alex Renton in conversation. Slavery has occurred in many forms throughout the world, but transatlantic slave trade between 1501 and 1867, which forcibly brought more than 12.5 million Africans to the New World, stands out for its systematic invasion at the global scale and its lasting legacy. The session, featuring an illustri illustrious panel of historians and journalists, explores the origin, rise and fall of the slave trade and unravels the historical, economic, and personal impact of this massive historical injustice. Let's welcome on stage Chris Manjapra. Chris is born in the Caribbean, works at the intersection of transnational history and the critical study of race and colonialism. He's professor at the Tufts University in Boston, USA. David Alusoga is a British Nigerian historian, author, presenter, and BAFTA winning filmmaker. He's a professor of public history at the University of Manchester. He has written seven books, including the award-winning books, Black and British, A Forgotten History and the World's War. Alex Renton. Alex is a British Canadian journalist and author. His most recent book, Blood Legacy, long listed for Belle Gifford Prize, examined the legacies of British colonialism and the transatlantic slavery. So over to this illustrious panel for this session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks to my fellow panelists. Um, this is going to be a three-way conversation, um, but I'm a journalist, so I will inevitably end up running it in a sort of control freaky kind of way. Um, I wanted to begin, and I think it's important to to frame conversations about new world slavery in the Atlantic world in these terms. Because we use this word slavery to describe an enormous range of phenomena that spread over an enormous geographic range and over millennia. Can you both tell me what is distinct, what is new about the forms of slavery that emerge in the new world, in the Atlantic world from the, 17th, in the 16th, 17th centuries? Sure, I can start. Um, I would say it's industrialization, it's industrial slavery, it's the extent of the extraction and oppression um, of the slave system. I think it's the intensity, really, of the Western, the Atlantic system that makes it distinct. What strikes you, Alex? The mic's on. Uh, it, it, I mean, certainly the industrialization of it. I mean, I, I've looked at the the at the history of British slavery in the Caribbean through the narrow lens of my own my own ancestors, my great grandfathers and great uncles, times six, uh, and and you can see from them as businessmen uh, that they are exploiting a legal system and a, 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 a governmental system that encourages them to invest is the word they use, in African people and in land in the Caribbean. So for, for me that, I, I mean, I, I'd like you get pushed back, um, sometimes quite antagonistic about this book and its message, and people will go, well, what about the pyramids? Slavery has always, always been with us. And I go, what about modern slavery? And I make the point that this is legal, governmentally organized, um, a huge contributor to the British economy at the time. The British government earned more in taxes than my ancestors did from, from their slavery enterprises. But most of all, it's entirely about race. And, and I was, you could not, by the time my ancestors were involved, be, be enslaved in Britain. And they certainly, the white men they employed in Jamaica had, in, you know, as in a semi-slavery state, had rights that none of the black people ever did. And I think, I mean, I've been reading Chris's amazing book, it is the only slavery system which is entirely about skin color. 
Is, is that correct? Is it only one, one ethnic group is enslaved, others isn't? Yeah, it's entirely about skin color and capitalism at the same time, and the inter, in, the, they're interwoven, and I think that is exactly the way we should think of its distinction. But I don't, David, what, what do you think about that? Well, there's often a chicken and the egg conversation that's had when we talk about slavery and we talk about race. And the question is whether racism was born of slavery or whether slavery just, uh, racism justified slavery. And we know it's the former. Um, to me, there are two fundamental distinctions that make what happened in the New World different to anything else in human history. The first is that it is racialized. It is about one ethnic group. To be black is to, be, is to carry the mark of the slave. And we see this encoded into law in the 1660s in Barbados. The infamous Barbados slave code is drafted. And we can see 17th century Englishmen stumbling towards a language of black and white. They haven't quite got the words. They talk about servants and heathens and white men. They don't use white and black yet, but it's stumbling towards a binary racial system. And what's created in Barbados is, a, is the world's first slave society. It's absolutely about race. Race is the marker of freedom or unfreedom. But the other thing that's different is that it lives on. Nobody finds themselves disadvantaged in the 21st century because their ancestors were enslaved by the Roman Empire. Or even, you know, in large cases by the, by the Ottoman Empire, our former prime minister was descended from um, Socrates Ottoman slaves. But because race wasn't a marker, he has none of the, carried none of the disadvantages that black people carry because this enormous sets of stereotypes and ideas um, and cliches about the nature of black people born to justify, defend, and perpetuate slavery live on. So the ideas that made this possible have, in the long run, proved far more sustainable and, you could argue, far more damaging than the phenomena itself. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of... Um, we were talking this morning about the different systems of slavery in the world, and, and I was saying we could think of it as, you know, an Atlantic Ocean, an Indian Ocean, and a Pacific Ocean system, all working, you know, in the 1700s, the 1800s, 1900s, even in the 20, 20th century, um, uh, into the 20th century. And I think what they all actually shared by the time of, you know, the 1700s is that there was, they were defined by anti-blackness. Um, they were defined, all of these oceans were characterized by trades in which um, race was uh, um, the marker for a particular kind of exploitation um, that would be reserved for a group marked on their skin. Uh, and so the global extent of anti-blackness, I think, is something to, 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 to wonder about, think about, um, and, you know, and kind of sit with, even as we're, we have conversations about race that operate within nation states. So here in India, you know, I think it's actually a really interesting question. How do we think of anti-blackness? Um, what are the ways that anti-blackness and, for example, the uh, oppression of Dalit communities, Adivasi communities, or African communities like the Siddhis in India, you know, how are those connected? So I, I really think that anti-blackness is a key term um, that still is very, very operational. One of the things I can hope we can talk about in this conversation is not just the history of slavery, but how challenging and how sometimes hostile it is to discuss, to explore, to write about this history. Um, and it's for that reason that I'm glad that you've mentioned, because we will be accused, as I constantly am, of not mentioning other forms of slavery, that you, you have reminded us that there was uh, a slave system on the east of Africa that moved, that carried Africans, probably a similar number, between 10, 10 and 15 million, uh, into, into India, into the Middle East. Uh, there was a sub uh, uh, cross trans Saharan um, slave trade. So the Atlantic slave trade is one of the slave trades stripping people from Africa. That's right. Um, and what all of these systems share, you know, we, we talked about the distinction of the Western system of slavery, the Atlantic system, but what they all share is um, coercion. They share the movement of people from their homes to distant places. Um, they, I think one of the key pieces of, of what enslavement does, well, two things. One is making people into property, um, and that's a crime against humanity. Um, but then it's also removing people from their culture, from their language, from their ethnicity, from their food ways, from their music, from their, and, and to the human spirit, that is uh, devastating. And the, the, the devastation can last for generations. And the healing that's needed can take 
it, it's an on, you know, ongoing process, and that also lasts for generations. So there's a particular, you know, there's a particular violence that we're talking about here. And one of the moving things in your book is your description, post, you know, in, in the, the, the the awful failures and and, and crimes of the post-emancipation period, how uh, African peoples in the Caribbean try to reconstruct that societies and, and rituals and, and, and a, a, sen a sense of being, really, of, being, of coming back to humanity. Because I'm struck continually in, in my ancestors' letters that, it, it, that it, there's an even more brutal interpretation, if you like, of, of, of the racial basis of British, of, of transatlantic slavery, which is that, that again and again in, in, in lists of, of, um, uh, of, the, of the possessions on the plantation, that children are listed alongside the cows and the horses, that my, my great uncle and member of parliament and a, a member of the Scottish Enlightenment can write to his manager in 1792 and say, get down to Kingston, buy more young girls because we need to breed more because abolition of the trade is on its way. So he quite clearly as a Christian and an enlightened Whig, a liberal, sees the African people as equivalent to animals. Can you, we should just say, um, if you could just explain, just for those who haven't, uh, don't know much about your book, just explain the, uh, the story that your, your book tells. Yes, I, well, I'm immensely privileged in, in, in many ways, but not least in that, in that um, my, like posh people do sometimes in Britain, my family keeps their papers. And, and I, I, five years ago, found uh, a, a pretty much forgotten archive in, down in the old servants' hall um, in the in the uh, grand house that my my grandparents lived in in, in rural Scotland and and in in that story and with with my access to that archive I found that I could tell the story of, of um, 115 years of plantation ownership in Tobago and then longer in Jamaica right through to 1875 so through the post emancipation period and, and, and this um, was known in your family it wasn't a family secret but the details had never been he, revealed my, my grandfather who is who was a fairly well known historian in Scotland had catalogued it and and that's how I found I was idly reading his catalogue down in the basement and the words Jamaica and Tobago kept coming up and I asked my mother who said oh yes he did mention this because he did visit Jamaica towards the end of his life and he said but we had nothing to be ashamed of because everyone was doing it which he meant Scottish gentry were and um, we hadn't made much money and then it had been slide, slid aside and put away and of course you know one of the, the crimes is we might talk about is the way archives like this and, and indeed the, the story, you know, the fragments of story of the black people who suffered on the plantation and died um, remains in the hands of the people who enslaved them. So you had that experience that anybody who studied slavery will remember the first time it happens to them. And I'd like to talk to you about this, Chris. Is the first time you encounter a slave ledger, could you paint a picture of those documents and the emotions and the experience of opening those pages and encountering those people. Yeah, um, sure. I, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about uh, a research trip that I took to the National Archives in Kew in London, which is where um, you know we go to go to the official archives on, on British slavery. Um, and I remember sitting in in the the chair and ordering the documents I was reading on Emancipation Acts, and there was a particular um, story. Uh, narrative um, of uh, an enslaved person named Philip who would have been 15 years old when um, he disappeared from a plantation and uh, his slave owner asked for his value because slave owners were compensated for uh, emancipation of slaves and they were and each slave was was accorded a price and so the slave owner was asking for Philip's price um, and the slave owner wrote some years after Philip disappeared, that it's rumored that, that Philip has died, um, and I'd like to claim the value of his life, but kind of two years after his death. And the, the, the uh, grotesqueness of that narrative, um, of that document, really stuck with me. And I'll just say, more than what was written on the page, actually, it was the smell of the paper that stuck with me. You know, it smelt of, to me, it smelt of tobacco and it smelt of sweat, and it smelt of anger. Um, and, and, and fear and, you know, ugly emotion. Um, and, I, and I wondered whether it was in some ways the scent of this enslaver that was left on the document that he himself had signed by, by, by hand. 
So, you know, that's a story from the archive. And I think the sense, you know, that the, the smell is as much a part of it as what's written on the page. I mean, the, the documents are extraordinary. And, and, and I mean, transcribing 18th century handwriting is a, a long job that I did with my mother, actually, uh, during, uh, sorry, uh, transcribing 18th century handwritten draft letters, mainly, it is a long job. And, 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 I've, and I found myself, because I, I began to feel some emotional attachment to my ancestors, because they seemed like modern men with whom I could have conversations. I mean, I, the, the, the younger brother who went to Tobago, his jokes were, made sense to me, and they were funny. And he, and he writes that the, he hates the other planters, that they're brutal to the Africans, which is, he thinks is a bad idea, and they're all drunk, which is why they die so quickly. So I found myself attaching to him and then searching for goodness. But then within those huge books and those long full-scat papers, as, as you say, the, the horror reeks out of them. And, and, you, and I think, I mean, the first time I felt physically nauseated sitting down there in the old basement was when I read a letter from Jamie Ferguson, my great uncle times however many, to, to his older brother, his backer, in which he talks about working in the Tobago jungle, because it's a new plot with the 10 Igbo people that he's bought, um, to clear the land and how proud he is of stripping to the waist and working alongside them and then tending their wounds and painting a, a, a picture of men together, common humanity. And, but then in the next paragraph, he outlines a, a logo, J-A-F, three letters, their, their initials, and says that as soon as, dear brother, you approve of this mark, I'll send to Barbados and have it cast in silver so I can mark the slaves, so I can brand them. And, and the lack of, it is normal, but the, the, I'd become emotionally involved with this man, and I see that he, he while well, like me and that I could be him, he was somewhere completely different and monstrous. Can I ask a quick question about what you just said, Alex? I wanted to ask about, you know, some people when confronting this history, and it's also a family history, the response would be aversion or would be repulsion or would simply be just close the book and walk away. So that you didn't do that and, and your response is to put words on it and to stay in relationship with what's, what was there. I just wanted, wonder if you could talk more about that. What, what does that feel like? Why, how did you do that? Why did well, you do that? I, I've spent my life as an investigative journalist, and, and, I, and I, on one level, I had a, an amazing source material that seemed wrong to leave it in the dark because the other people in the story, their descendants needed to know it, and, and it was a great story. But I think I felt, I talked to, to, to a lot of friends when I'd done my first trawl through, and, and a lot of friends of color said, I'm not really interested in another sheaf of slavery horror. I am interested in how you white people are going to heal yourselves. And I heard that again when I went to Jamaica. And, and I think it, it seemed very clear very quickly that the, the story had to be told because these were men with whom you could feel some empathy. Strange word for it to feel with a slaver. But they, so they're not othered as monsters. They're people who could be in the modern age and we need to address that. And secondly, the sort of thing that I've, as a sort of a standard liberal journalist. I've been in ignorance all my life, which is how that story toxifies my country today. The, 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 the decisions my ancestors made about race and the slurs that they enabled themselves, that enabled them to do what they did for greed, still drive many people in Britain and the structural racism there now. I, I mean, and it's, you know, I'm ashamed that I got to this age without, without clocking that one, you know. Thank you. Um, I want to leave um, a bit longer for questions in this session than I normally would. So we've got about another 15 minutes, then 15 minutes for questions. And I want, in the time that we've got talking the three of us, to talk about not just this history, but what it is to study it and why it is so assailed. Um, this is a history that is under attack. The historians who write about slavery, like those who write about empire, have to constantly justify why they do what they do. Books about history, when they're published, are scoured and, and analyzed for, uh, with attempts to refute their findings. Um, this is a history that was buried. It is rising to the surface. 
Many people are very uncomfortable about this. How do you, as a historian of slavery, navigate this moment that we're living through? Yeah. What, a, um, what a question that kind of touches a, a, sore, a sore spot. So a sore spot in the sense that these, what David, you're pointing to is stuff that I deal with you know, like right now in my life, um, in terms of attacks, um, attacks from professional historians and attacks from journalists, which I experience as um, kind of low, low blows. Um, often there's a there's a there's a tinge of wanting to demonize. What uh, Alex mentioned the word monster to make into the monster the person writing the history. So I think this the relationship to monsters right now is very interesting and in how they're being invented and who the monsters supposedly are. And so the question is, you know, how does one respond to that? And um, part of it is just, you know, resilience and just, you know, the, the, the resilience of the, tr the truth will out and you do your own piece and somebody will do their own piece. Um, part of it, I think, is also analytical, you know, actually paying attention to what are the attacks and where what is their strategy you know and i'll name a couple strategies that i've noticed i'm curious what your strategy what strategies you've you've been seeing i think and i mentioned this this morning one of the key strategies is to number one erase context so to just go for we're all people we're all individuals so you're attacking me and i'm going to attack you uh, history out the door from the start um, and i think uh, uh, another key strategy is to um, to, to assert that the person who is in some ways bringing forth this history, this difficult history, is doing so in order to terrorize, in order to, um, you know, guilt trip, right? In order to play some kind of really dubious moral uh, game on an audience, um, which, is, which is a really strong assertion to make. So basically questioning the, the, mora the moral position of the author. Uh, those are just two that I've noticed, but I think it's actually, at this point, I think that there is a very organized backlash that is emerging. I think it would, it would actually be really helpful to think through what are the strategies that are being used for that, right, to make it work. And how do you find, having written a book, a very personal book uh, about slavery, were you surprised at how hostile the reaction can be to books on this subject? Yeah, I, I was. I mean, uh, often when you write a book, you learn much more after writing it than you than you did before. And, uh, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I was I was naive about just how how the reaction would be and just how aggressive and how can I say stupid? I mean, uh, uneducated. And and I think I add add one, one to your your list of motivations. The other, particularly in Britain, is we, we and you far more than I get attacked for destroying our great history or rewriting our great history um, as though that was some foundational and actually members of my own family have reacted in the same way i've destroyed the family honor one of one elderly relative put it to me you go what honor is based on a lie and 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 you realize that you know my very expensive education 50 years ago in england was a lie on this issue wilberforce was a saint um, the British ended slavery for the whole world in 1807. And then to quote Jeremy Clarkson the other day, spent more money policing slavery after they ended it than they ever earned from slavery. It took a year to get the Sunday Times to correct that one. So, so but what we see in Britain is, is this alliance of dinosaur white, chiefly, not always, uh, white historians who don't like their turf being taken, making a really nasty alliance with people from the right wing in journalism and politics who, who have a, another agenda, which is, which is you know, deep in the culture war and, and the larger thing we know is going on. But I have to say, no one has attacked me because of my skin color. Whereas you, you've had to take um, security to book festivals, yeah. if, if you don't mind me. I think that's what said. That's, that's my, my colleague and friend from the Times, Satnam um, Sangera, has had a vicious time, including from within his own newspaper, where there are racist columnists employed. And this is in America as well. I mean, this is a, I mean, is this a delayed reaction? Is it because so many people have, have built part of their identity on versions of this history that minimizes slavery or rationalizes it as a way or focuses on abolition rather than enslavement itself? Um, is this the consequence of not dealing with the history earlier? that all of this aggression is being poured into this debate. Um, yeah, I, I kind of want to ask you, David, how, 
first of all, how have you experienced this? And what is your response to it? How, how are you handling the moment that we're in um, and the kinds of attacks that are coming? What, 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 do, you, what do you respond to? Most of the attacks are easy to refute because they're not based on fact. Uh, the number of people who feel um, that they can accuse me of hating Britain and hating white people when I'm obviously a manifestly mixed race, um, I'm astonished at the number of people who, th who think that I, for some reason, <clears throat> want to create discord between black and white people. I mean, my family is as challenging as most families. I don't know why I'd want to add that element to our Christmases. Um, I think what's interesting is to ask people why and to do the, 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 the most useful thing you can do in rhetoric, which is to ask people repeatedly the question, why? Why do they think this? Why are they comfortable saying things? Why are they uh, uncomfortable? Very often when, I, when I'm talking about slavery, somebody will repeatedly come up with arguments that are ways of minimizing it. Other countries did it. Africans and traded um, enslaved people. Slavery is an ancient institution. And in some ways those arguments aren't interesting because there's an answer to all of those, all of those phenomena. Of course there were other slave trades. Of course slavery is ancient though distinct from the forms that emerge in the new world. What is interesting is the motivation for why people spend so much effort trying to find a way of saying this is not something we need to worry about. And it's the same talking about the, the empire. Whenever I talk about the British Empire, I can guarantee someone will go, but the British Empire was better than the Dutch Empire, or the Belgians in the Congo, or the Germans in Namibia. Or they'll talk about modern day slavery. And all of these are actually forms of silencing black people, or silencing historians. What people are really saying is stop talking about this. It's making me feel uncomfortable. And we as human beings will go a long way to avoid discomfort. It is one of the features of us as a species. We go out of our way to seek comfort and avoid discomfort. But the problem is, is our comfort is based on denying the history of millions of people around the world who are the descendants of these systems. So your comfort comes as a cost. Um, the demographics of the West are changing radically. Um, Britain, by 2050, according to one projection, will be 29, 30% not white. Now, the vast majority of that, almost one in three people, have family histories that are connected to the stories of empire and very often enslavement. We can't have histories that are shared histories if we cling to these old historical forms that marginalized these stories. So I personally think I'm engaged in a form of modernization, a form of expansion of history, and yet the charge is that I'm destroying history, uh, wrecking something rather than adding something to it. I want more history, not, not less history. And the most important thing, and I say this very often, is people will make these attacks on historians like myself, and they will argue that these histories are a threat to their histories and their identities. Well, these histories are their histories. I'm, I'm half um, British working class. My mother's family is Scottish. One of my ancestors was a colonial soldier here in India, but my father's family are Nigerian. Um, those backgrounds, those family histories are going to become almost ubiquitous, very commonly. I mean, the, I, we, we were talking earlier about how, how Chris's book ends extraordinarily and, and very beautifully on, on an optimistic note. And, and a lot of writers who write about these issues strive for that. I've never managed it. optimism as all <laughs> anyone who's read but, my books can testify. But, but, uh, and, and, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't think there is, you know, and, and particularly in my position as part of the, the establishment, and, and, and my ancestors were politicians after they made their money for slavery and helped run the empire. It, 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 I'm, I'm in no position to, to tell anyone how, how it's going to get better. But, but there is hope there in youth and good sense and our great liberal values and historians, you know, the, the, the duty of history to look, look honestly at things again. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, how, is it in, how, how is it going in the States? Well, I mean, I wanted to bring up the, there's a way of thinking of US history, which I find really helpful here in our current moment, which is in terms of reconstructions and backlashes. And, you know, for, for, for those of us who, 
who know kind of canonical US history, we know that there's a civil war and then there's that era of reconstruction, which lasts for about a, a decade in which there were reparative actions taken. You know, there were more black people um, in legislature uh, in uh, five years after the civil war than there would ever be for another century. Um, so there, things were changing and then there was a response. Then there was a concerted response to put on the brakes and to get into backlash. So, you know, historians make the point that there's more than one reconstruction in history, that history is about reconstructions. That's just the way it works. It's not gonna be a linear process. So we had a reconstruction in the 1860s. We had a reconstruction in the 1960s. And some people say, this is another moment of reconstruction. Um, it's a, it's a maybe a mixed one, but and we're, we're seeing it before our eyes. You know, the fact that we are still in this, the UN century for black people um, shows that there are, there's a discourse that has moved, but we're also seeing the backlash that wants to shut things down. Um, and so in our lifetime, you know, is this going to be the only era of reconstruction and backlash? Probably not. It's probably coming again. And so the question is, what do we, how do we not give up hope and to keep pushing for a true reconstruction? And I would just say that in terms of reconstruction, I like that term because it means that we're doing something with the broken stuff. You know, we're not throwing things away. We're not throwing monuments out the window. We're not, you know, we're, we're taking what we have and we're making something new from it. That, to me, is exciting. And that's what we want. Yeah. That's, that's what we want. Let me pick up on one of, the, um, one of the statements that anyone who writes about slavery and empire will hear, will see, and if they're crazy enough to be on Twitter, will encounter in their feed, which is, it's all in the past. Leave it alone. Um, why are you raking up? Raking up is the favorite phrase in England. I don't know if it's used in the United States. Why are you raking up this painful memories? Get over it. Right. That's exactly what, Pres uh, what Prime Minister Cameron said when he went to Jamaica in 2015. Move you know, on. move on. Yeah. You know, move on. Um, but in the move on, there's also the wish to uh, erase context. You know, it's possible to move on from things if we believe that that history is still not actually alive. Um, and, 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 you know, Alex, you mentioned what it was like to go to your family papers. And, you know, from, from, I have this story of going to a place where there are no papers, which is, you know, going to a rural part of Bahamas and going to, uh, looking for the story of my, my fourth grandmother who uh, likely came on an, a, a ship, a slave ship from Africa. And I didn't find papers. Um, what I found is this, um, this, this, it's called, a, they're called the blue holes. They are a particular kind of um, uh, formation a geophysical formation that they have in the Bahamas. It's a deep, deep, deep pool of water, and the pool is so deep that you can't see the bottom, and the, the surface becomes like this beautiful mirror. And, I, and what I found when I was in Bahamas looking for my grandmother's story is that I didn't find it in any of the ways that I was expecting. Um, people couldn't, didn't have memory of her, there were no documents of her, but I nevertheless felt her, especially around that blue hole. And to me, that was metaphorical because this is, these are voids. You know, we all are dealing with this void in our collective history around what slavery has done and continues to do, what racism has done and continues to do. But if we come closer to the void as opposed to turning away from it and saying, let's just move on, something happens to us and we are better for it. You know, so we're not better if we turn away and run away, um, which is, I think, in some ways, underdeveloped and juvenile reaction of... Um, you know, of, of, of people who I want to say are, 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 are writing these, these really nasty reviews and, 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 and trying to, 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 to stop, stop the discussion and to run the backlash. And, and did you find something similar, Alex? That, I mean, when you write a book about slavery, people genuinely suggest that you shouldn't. I mean, I write about yeah. the First World War, I write about the Victorian slums, I write about the history of houses. No one has ever said asked me to justify writing those books. No one's ever told me to, and no one would dream. I mean, one of my specialisms is the First World War. No one yeah. would dream of saying we should move on. It was a long time ago. I know it was terrible. Uh, and yet every time I talk about slavery and empire, it's move on. Yeah. Did, did you find a similar demand for justification well, of your work? I, I, mean, I mean, for me, the, 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 the best bit of working on this book once we transcribed all those papers was um, going to Jamaica and Tobago to the site 
to the plantations, to the places and, uh, where, where, which I now knew about from the letters 250 years earlier, and, and asking people there, and, and people, you know, all sorts of walks of life. I mean, really, two questions. I mean, I, I fessed up about who I was and why I was there, and people were very generous and interested in that, welcomed me, and, and then I said, how does slavery affect you today, and, and what do you think we should do? And, and really the answers are pretty universal because almost everyone I mentioned, mentioned colorism. You know, the judgment of people and the, the lack of advantage, the privilege of having a lighter skin and the, the, you know, whether it's being an act, an act of appearing in an advert or, or getting a job. And, and that is something that comes directly, and I can see it in my ancestors' letters from the, the preferred jobs that the, the, the people of mixed race, the products of rape, um, from, by the white Scottish managers, um, they got the, house, the jobs and the houses. That pertains today, and for that, to me, answered every move on demand, because it, it, that history is not acknowledged by people like me, and it is still ruining and spoiling the lives of people, of the descendants of those whom we enslaved. So, so I don't see how anyone can argue against that. It's this current history. Jeff Palmer, who you know, is a great campaigner, a, a sort of kind of a Windrush child, who's now um, Scotland's senior professor of, of and, and a knight, uh, who very gently in his retirement lectures Scots on how the good things that can come from acknowledgement and apology. Um, he says you can't change this history, but you can change the consequences of it. And for me, that's inspiring. And for me, that lives in reparations, which, or reparative justice, which perhaps we've got a moment to talk about. Well, I promise to leave time for questions. I know from experience at JLF and other events that this is a subject that often uh, attracts lots of questions. I'm sure reparations will come in in questions. There's a gentleman here on the front row. Um, Thank you very much. Um, one would hope that as a society, we would learn from the lessons of history. Uh, but regrettably, um, current estimates of modern slavery suggest there may be up to 50 million people trapped in various forms of forced labour. I just wondered if you could share any thoughts or reflections that you might have on how we, the people in this hall, can actually contribute in any way to breaking that, cycle, that ongoing cycle of exploitation of vulnerable people. Can I, I don't think we're here to talk about modern slavery. I, we're here to talk about a legalized form of slavery done as a tax earner for government. Modern slavery is illegal, and if, if you're caught, you will, you know, in most countries, you'll be fined. There's a lady, a lady here in the, in the middle. Uh, can you tell us something about slavery that went out of India? Um, you know, the Hindu Kush uh, slavery, please. Um, I, I, there's a, a big story that we should be telling, talking more about in terms of slavery as it relates to, to India, and I'm going to be very brief, just a, a thumbnail of it to say, especially in the time that we're talking about on, on our panel, modern, the modern period, um, of course, South Asian people were being drawn into the same networks that um, plantation slavery had created, especially as the slaves were emancipated. We have this indenture system of Dalit communities, Adivasi communities, uh, poor agrarian workers who are being sucked out of South Asia and sent across the globe to work on plantations. And so I think we can create a very tight connection between the discussions around black slavery and anti-blackness and the experience of Indian people who actually also experience anti-blackness um, within this framework um, of, of plantation slavery and its continuations. I'd love to have that conversation probably another time. And of course, one of the legacies of slavery, one of the most striking legacies is this enormous demographic reordering. It is the biggest forced migration in human history until the 20th century. And the populations of these American islands in the Caribbean are Africans and people from the Indian, Indian subcontinent. The, the imprint of slavery on our world is absolutely, it's astonishing. It's, it is one of those phenomena um, that I think is more visible than almost anything else I can think of. There's a lady here at the, at, at the front. Hi. Um, first of all, I do want to commend you on having such a, like, academic and calm, because I think, again, you were talking about this topic brings up a lot of very strong emotions in people, so I have to commend you for, like, um, you know, stating the facts and, like, being uh, 
you, you know, I really like everything is really understandable. So I was reading something recently about uh, the effects of modern, I mean, sorry, of slavery, of transatlantic slavery uh, on the current economic situation in Africa, in uh, both East and West Africa primarily, like in those countries. But um, yeah, so I, I would like to hear some of your reflections on that because it is a topic that I want to start getting into more and um, yeah. Chris, can, you've written well, well on this. I can say a word on this uh, because I think it's it's connected to a previous question, which is I actually feel that the discussion around reparations, which we are hearing more and more of today, is a vast conversation. And it, it, it has its historical root in helping us address the legacies of anti-blackness, but also the legacies of anti-indigeneity, the way that indigenous people are also continually being exploited in these extreme ways today as well. Um, as well as a number of other groups, including minority groups in post-colonial nation states that um, are experiencing very intense forms of oppression today. So I, I think all of this um, has to do with the way that um, violence and exploitation is continuing. And we need to continue to have reparative justice conversations pointing out the injustice and also having conversations around sovereignty, land rights, legal rights, redistribution of wealth. These are the matters that we really should be talking about in terms of who has the power and who should be granted access to power but are not, you know, in our contemporary world. And it's not just an American or a British situation. That's a conversation we could have about the communities here in India too, right? We could have that reparative conversation about India and we should be having it. Thanks, Chris. We've got a gentleman here in the front. Okay, hello. My question is uh, directed to uh, Sir Vincent Brown on my right. Okay. Uh, uh, Vincent couldn't make it because of COVID. Okay. Uh, I didn't get your name. Sorry, sir. My name's Alex Renton. Okay. So as a young uh, man of African descent, I've heard some, some comments from white people that m they may not have said it in a racist way, but it felt to me as uh, an insult to the past of my people. And I wanted to know from you, do you think uh, in your book, you take into account that you may hurt some people and uh, try to have a little bit of empathy in your writing or not? Uh, th thanks for the question. I, I think someone like me with my privilege in this world um, needs to question how they interact with other people, particularly people from other ethnic backgrounds all the time. We, we've, I've gone through most of my life not considering that question and researching and writing the book has led me to think, I hope much more deeply and empathetically. Um, I, can, I, can, I, I can only say I'm, I'm, I'm still working on it. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman at the back. Hello, my question to all of you is, uh, uh, the slavery was not only practiced in Britain, but also in other country that is America. Now we are seeing a kind of regression in racial sensitivity. Uh, the critical race theory is being removed by the fascist Republican governments in many schools. So how do you think that uh, the kids, the future generations will come to know about its cruelty, uh, insensitivity and all. Also another question to Alex specifically is, that you have been a journalist for so long. So do you ever plan to write a book about your life and your experiences? Um, so let's take the first question. I, I think we need to be clear and specific. Uh, critical race theory never existed in American schools. Um, this is an entirely fabricated uh, demonization of a rather obscure branch of legal studies. It was never in school textbooks. Lots of aspects of the study of slavery that exist in many areas, many fields, are being described as CRT, critical race theory, because it sounds, it's something that they could demonize. So I think there is absolutely a problem with um, books being banned and curriculums being narrowed. But we have to call out this attack on critical race theory for what it is. It is a false flag demonization of an obscure branch um, of American uh, jurisprudence studies. I've been accused by historians who really should know better of being somebody uh, whose ideas are shaped by critical race theory. And I've challenged them to find a single reference in anything I've ever written, books or articles or papers, that has a single reference to a work of critical race theory. Now that doesn't make any difference. Because this is just, a, they've found something. It, it seems very probable that the Virginia election, that that may have been 
in 2022 may have been the key issue that won it for the Republicans, this demonization of critical race theory. So it was never in schools, so it could never be taken out. Alex, on your point? I, I, I've no plans to write a book about myself. I, 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 I'd, I'd have to be very bored and without any work whatsoever, I think, even to consider such a thing. But thank you for the suggestion. Uh, more questions? I, I mean, can you just, just on the... the the CRT issue and so on. And there are accusations in the British press that it's critical race theory is flooding through, being pushed through our schools. I mean, it, it is complete nonsense and, and, and terrifying. What we have to realize is that part of the, the sort of, you know, almost you know, the, the, the vile and, and stupid reaction from elderly academics and backed by the right wing is also a, a really worrying attempt to to a, a wrestling match over the curriculum and over what our children are going to be taught in the future. And we know that's going on in the States. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to comment about how things I'll are just, in America? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, it's interesting to think about how old the a, attacks are or these strategies are. So uh, there's this, again, this amazing book I was mentioning it this, this morning by, um, by Clyde Woods called Arrested Development, and he talks about, you know, blues, as a part of the book is about blues. But part of the book is what he calls the plantation plans, that uh, planters in the South, uh, and he talks about five of them, basically instituted, you know, every five years after the end of the Civil War, making the point that the end of the Civil War was the beginning of a war by other means. And um, the means that planters used were very familiar to us in terms of what's happening today. And a lot of it is about framing a discussion in a way that's regressive. A lot of it is about um, using various forms of violence um, and, and actually terrorization of people, you know, to try to prevent people from talking. These are old strategies. And so to me, that's encouraging because there's nothing new here, you know, and the old strategies are not going to work because they haven't worked 100, 150 years ago. They're not going to work today. I think that continuity is really important. I mean, the reality is black people, for some reason, we always seem, according to our opponents, to be doing it the wrong way. It's not that they're racist. It's that we've got the wrong, the wrong organizations or the wrong symbols or the wrong gestures. It's not that we don't want equality. It's that we don't like the black power salute. We don't like taking the knee. It's not that we don't want uh, racial equality. It's that um, you're too aligned to, to Marxism or too aligned to critical race theory. Black people, according to this thesis, basically always just get it wrong when we appeal for racial justice. And it is, there's a continuity there. You can see it, as you say, from reconstruction onwards. Um, it's the basic t don't be so aggressive slur, isn't yeah. it? We're, we are, we are running short on time. I'd like to get to a couple more questions. There's a lady here at the front. So, so in fact, David, my comment relates directly to what you just said. It's very interesting that the Americans will agree that they bombed and murdered millions of Japanese in Hiroshima. They don't criticize anyone who talks about that. The Germans, the Americans, everyone agree that the, the, the Nazis murdered six million Jews. A few people say this is a figment of their imagination, but most people don't disagree with that. So the point that you just made, why is it that they resist the way in which this issue is presented? You know, I mean, maybe are they afraid they'll have to do reparations, atonement? You know, in Japan, in Nazi Germany, you had a, had a tribunal and only a few people were held responsible. The rest were okay. So that's just a comment and a thought. And my question is just some insight on the origin of the African slave trade, because you all mentioned the three fronts of it. So when did it first begin? And did it accelerate under the caliphate? And then how did the Portuguese take hold of it? Alex and I went back sort of talking about that the other day. So well, those should, of you who know should, better, please inform us. We should pick up Alex on your conversation you had. Well, I, yeah, it's, though I'm no expert at all, I think these two are more than that. I mean, just on your first point, I mean, I should, you know, the Brit British government lawyers told David Cameron and, and we think the royal family when they recently sort of hilariously in an old imperialistic way visited the Caribbean not to apologize for fear that it could lead to lawsuits. Meanwhile, we see the Dutch government has apologized. Uh, so this is back to the reparations debate, which my government um, refuses even to engage in with CARICOM, which seems to me absurd. But, but sorry, the, the history of Portuguese slave trading. I'll give it to you. Um, I, 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 so, um, being being brief, I think um, 
like, I'm not sure if we talked about it in this panel, but we can see that slavery has a long history and um, certainly uh, cov touched Africa as it touched other parts of our world. Um, and that there is a early modern um, slave trade that has that that it happened before the coming of the Western um, imperial and capitalist interests, which was comparable with slavery in other parts of our world, as I'm saying, and has a lot to do with social elites and um, the relationship of social elites to social under groups, under classes. Um, this is something that Walter Rodney talks a lot about, and he actually makes the point. Let's, let's name it. Let's not pretend as if slavery is just a story about the coming of the West. That's not the case. But what is the case is once we've observed that, then we must observe that something changes historically from the 1500s onwards. And that has to do with the coming of the Portuguese and the Spanish and the British and the French and the Dutch. And that has a lot to do with the coming of racist ideas, you know, the coming of new ideas of who can be exploited, to what extent, and what that exploitation may entail. Um, so, so all of this is, is to say it's a complicated story, but something changes, and it does change with the coming of these capitalist empires. I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Thank you for proving me right that there will be lots of questions. Please join me in thanking Chris Manjapra and Alex Renton. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Chris Manjapra, David Olasuga, and Alex Renton for this enthralling session. Thank you to all of you for being here. There, there, there.